guess where we are? I'm on Manly Beach, waiting for my mate Ace Buckin, professional surfer for 18 years, environmentalist, and just a general good guy. And we're gonna be talking about move and mental health. And we're going surfing. Well, I'm gonna flop around. He's gonna surf. Still moving though. Great privilege, Ace, to, to be here with you, mate. So 18 years, professional surfer. I think maybe 16 on tour, but um, three or four on the, on the qualifying tour before that. It's probably been about 20, 23 odd years since I left school. <laughs> and beautiful family, wife and a couple of kids. Wife and three kids, yeah. Wow. So today's talking, I want to, want to cover a, a few subjects, but the first thing that that really impressed me about you. And even though I met online, you had this peace and calmness about you, which I thought really radiated, you know? In, in Māori, we call it mana. So it's your aura around you. Um, have you always been calm and... Uh, and... <laughs> yeah, ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all have our moments, don't we? But I mean, I get it from there. I get, I get that kind of sense of calmness and... Um, comfort from being in the ocean you know that's been my luckily been my career it's also my therapy you know I feel very lucky to have spent a life in and around the ocean and you know was lucky enough to take my family along with me for the ride you know I think my my father fell in love with surfing a bit later on in life he came from you know the middle of Africa pretty much and and moved to Australia on a bit of a a whim and a prayer in the late seventies because he wanted to raise a family with my mother somewhere other than South Africa at the time, which was in the middle of apartheid. Yep. And he was a rugby and a cricket man, you know, someone after your own heart. So he saw these photos in a surfing magazine and thought, I want to go and live there. You know, he was a school teacher, um, but he's a very relaxed, chilled man. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say much, but when he does, everyone listens. He's a school teacher, an English teacher. He taught me and my wife. Yeah, I think I've just been lucky enough to be exposed to different things in my life, traveled a lot and, you know, developed other interests outside of surfing, which I guess shape you. It gives you a different perspective. One of the key pillars, you know, we talk about the six pillars in a day. One of them's move, right? And I get a little bit upset because all the information you get is all about perfectionism, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, you think about the gym, you go to the gym, everyone's perfect, right? You never see a fat bastard <laughs> on the wall, you know, and you even see someone like me who's a bit overweight. Um, so how do you take your move and when did you associate it with your mental health? Being a professional athlete, you had to move. But when did you realise, like you mentioned before, actually, I need this to stay well? Well, you look great, by the way, mate. You're not <laughs> overweight. <laughs> I think I'm probably realising it more and more now is the truth. Like, you know, I'm just over 18 months out of being full-time on the tour, you know, and it's something, and you and I have chatted about this, like you've got these six pillars of mental health and until you kind of stop and, and really look at it, you don't realize, well, hang on, I was, I was doing all of those things in my day. I was moving, I was doing, I was connecting, I was chilling. And now that, you know, I'm not a selfish professional athlete thinking about me all the time, you know, I'm living a more normal life. You know, no one told me that like retirement would be more stressful than actually <laughs> competing. Yeah. But no, I, I'm doing stuff that, I love, but you know, as, as you've said and you've experienced, I think after your career, you're faced with a bunch of choices and, and opportunities and you need to set boundaries and you need to make that transition in a way that isn't a huge shock. Cause you know, we've both seen it. You have friends that really struggle with it. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a big change. Yeah. And I've realized that for me, 
my sense of calm and and um that that kind of stable kind of grounding feeling that I need comes from getting in the ocean and moving and doing what I love. So even if it's just an hour in the middle of the day or half an hour just to dive in the ocean and not even surf, but even just sitting here looking at it, right? Yeah. It's like that notion of, of blue therapy, which we're working on, yeah. that there's actually science around now is that we do as humans feel better when we're in, around or near a body of water. And I feel like, you know, you've said to me, like surfing saved your life. Yeah. Surfing's been the same for me, you know. Yeah. And just being near it makes me feel better. So I'm a uh, 19 year old wannabe professional surfer. What would you tell yourself from a mental health point of view to your younger self going into that environment? I think just to, to take a breath, you know, I think when you're young and you're, um, you know, you're motivated and you're excited, you know, and we talked about it in the surf this morning, like you're often operating on that adrenaline and you're always redlining and you're, you're mentally and physically, you know, always on the edge. And, you know, one of the positive things I've found probably more so from a physical perspective since I've stepped away from competing full time is that I don't feel like I'm at breaking point all the time. I'm not pushing my body. So just the fact that, you know, recovery and taking a breath and creating space for yourself is really important. And that often you can actually make gains outside of the gym and outside of the surf. There's a way to do that by connecting with people and connecting with yourself. You know, as I got older in my career, I used to watch the younger surfers come through and you'd, you'd watch them in and around an event and often you'd see them beat themselves before they even put the jersey on. You know, you, you kind of have that wisdom of experience to sit back and observe and, and know what it takes personally to get yourself in the groove, you know, in that zone where you're gonna operate at your best. I'm just gonna get back to the move thing because I was thinking um, about how I had to let go, right? And surfing's been very good for me because I'm not very good, right? And I think that's an important thing for people to realize. Like, it's okay, we, I go out with you today. Important for me to enjoy that moment. How, how do you think people need to think about, because I think competitive sport's different, right? I take you out on the rugby field, I'm gonna wanna beat you. You know, that's the competitive side. But I think so much of our moves, so people keep pushing us to this perfectionism. Yeah. How, how do you distinguish like when your move is, okay, I'm, I'm here to compete or I want to be really good at it and when it's spiritually based? See, surfing for me is spiritually based. I could have sat out there and just watched you surf. You know, it was about being in the water. I like to surf well because I've got an ego, but finding that, not beating yourself up about, oh, I'm going into the gym and I'm not lifting as those weights. Are you finding a tool to do that yourself and how would you suggest people do it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, all of these rituals, these, these movement rituals that we have, whether that's going to the gym, whether that's going for a run or, you know, doing this morning swim here that everybody does has a spiritual element to it. And it's, it's a habit that you create that makes you feel good. Like we were saying this morning, like it's amazing the amount of people here at Manly that get up and start their day with a swim or a run or a bike ride and they're all going to work when they open up their laptop, when they, you know, log on for their first call, that they're, they're feeling good about themselves. They've started their day with one of those pillars of mental health. And yeah, for me, surfing is, I, I feel lucky that surfing is a lifestyle choice, you know, like it's much more about the spiritual element than it is about the competitive success. It's, something that I now get to share with my kids. You know, I've got a nine-year-old, a six-year-old and a three-year-old and they all love the ocean. They love being in the water. They want to surf. When I take my three-year-old out and put him on the front of the soft top, you know, and we get a handful of waves, he doesn't want to go in even though he's shivering, you know, and he's got a huge smile on his face. To me, you know, yeah, I still get a buzz out of surfing well and like competing as much with myself now as I do with, you know, 
other top level athletes when I was on the tour. But it's just about, like you said, it's about being in nature and waking up and being out there when the sun rises, watching the tide change, being kind of tapped into something much greater than yourself and feeling like you're a part of that and part of a community. Like surfing is one of the only sports where you can sit in a lineup and see kids as young as seven or eight to, you know, my dad's 75 and he's still surfing. And you've got this lineup, which is a melting pot of all these different people from different backgrounds and, you know, ages and stages. And I think that's really special. I want to talk about fear, right? Because I think it, surfers have, like, I've got a limit. Like, now, when, if I'm a little bit unfit, not surfing enough, you know, three to four foot, anything above that, and it's actually, you get a bit scared, right? You put me on a rugby field against, against a rugby player, that was my profession, bring it on. You know, John Olomu, may he rest in peace. You know, I marked him when he was a young fella, big, strong, you know, and you just, you just, you just get yourself to a place where you're going to have to do something, right? Um, but how did, how did you deal with that fear? Did you have fear like Chopu, anyone who doesn't know surfing, you know, here's this wave that never should have been ridden and then I think Leon yeah. Hamilton rode yeah. it, you know, 15 years ago. I mean, how did you deal with the fear or it just wasn't any? No, I think fear is healthy. And I think you, you would say as well, like when you're, you know, standing up against Jonah Lomu, like there was an element of fear there, right? But then there was also an element of like believing in your skills and trusting your instinct, you know? And I think everyone has a different threshold. And, you know, when they talk about flow, it's that kind of concept of being pushed enough to your level, but not, you know, outside your skill set that puts you in that perfect position where you can kind of get into that flow state. And sometimes you find it, sometimes you don't. Um, and it's different for everyone. But I think fear's healthy. You know, that's how we grow when you kind of lean into that vulnerability. And I think, you know, for me, fear now probably manifests itself in different ways. Like when I was on the tour, like you said, it was like, all right, I've got to heat it, you know, 12 foot Chopu against Kelly Slater and Owen Wright or, um, you know, Mick Fanning and shit. Like, how am I going to, like, when I've got priority and the set comes and everyone's screaming, like, am I going to, am I going to take off? Now it's like changing that sense of identity. Like I'm not Ace Buck and the pro surfer. Um, but that was only something I did. It was, it's not who I am. And it's seeing that vulnerability or that fear as an opportunity to grow and explore different things in your life you know and I think so often the easiest thing to do is to keep doing things the same way but you know we don't change do we so you did you prepare for that did you know that fear was coming and let's go back to 12 foot chopu right so you know the fear is going to be there or did you just did you prepare for that or did you just go, I need to face it at the time? No, you definitely prepare for it. At least, at least I did. Like, and I think, you know, everyone deals with it differently. Um, I used to visualize, you know, myself in the situations and, and being calm. And, you know, I was quite calculated. I wasn't like super gung ho and, um, reckless. I was calculated. I'd put myself in positions that I knew my skills could get me out of. There were people that were more reckless and there were people that were, you know, more skillful than me that were, that were more fearful. You know, like I had a great friend who I used to travel with, Matty Wilkinson, who, you know, grew up on the central coast with me. He was world number one for a period in time. And one of those really big years at Chopu, I was caddying for him and he was in a heat on one of the really big days and he was really scared and he was quite open about that, but he ended up getting a perfect 10, you know, like because he just surrendered to that opportunity and his skill set. And I remember at kind of the halfway point through the heat, he needed a 3.6 to, which is a small score to, to, to win the heat. And he paddled back out after one of his waves and he said, I just want to get a 3.6 and I want to go home and cuddle my mum. 
<laughs> you know, like, and I just like... Good on you. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, everybody shares that discomfort and fear in different ways. I love that because I do think you need to prepare. So how have you translated that now into normal life? Not a pro anymore. You talked about other fears. And this is what I think people need to understand. It's your fear. It might be a 20 foot wave. It might be a five foot wave. Yeah. It's still your fear. So how are you now preparing that, you know, to become the businessman, the environmentalist, you know, those things. How have you translated that into some of the fears you're having in normal life? Yeah, I think, like I said, the fears are different. I think there are a lot of lessons from being a high level athlete that we can take into the corporate world that aren't embraced as, as much as they should be, you know, like, and you would know this as an athlete, you, when you're doing things well, you're, you prepare meticulously, you know, what you need as an individual to perform at your highest level. You also crave feedback, positive, negative, it's not something you shy away from because you want to get better and then you recover to do that again. And I think in the corporate world, we underprepare because we're stressed and we're handling too many work streams. We're fearful of feedback because you want to protect your job. No one's, you know, sourcing that feedback as much as they should be, or at least not enough people. And then we're not recovering because there's something else. There's another email to answer. There's another Zoom to jump on. There's another document to finish. So a lot of that gets lost in the, in the pace of that, of that corporate life. So I think there are lessons there that I'm trying to take from my professional career back to the corporate setting. And maybe part of that's me being selfish, like saying I need to get out there and have another surf to kind of like, drop the blood pressure, but I do think there are things that we could take from, from sport into business. Ace, big learnings for me um, about fear, you know, prepare for it. I thought yeah. that, that really resonated, really resonated with me. And then your move's your move, right? Like if you wanna be a Muppet surfer like I am. Do it. Yeah, just do it. Just <laughs> get out there and enjoy the moment as, as, as long as you're moving. Best surfer's the one having the most fun. Yeah, that, that's right, that's right. Thank you, mate. Appreciate your time. Mate, thank you. It was an honor. Appreciate it.